in the sky is my idea of nothing to do. I'd get a kick out of you. All righty there, guys um, and ladies. Because I see you have a couple of ladies here as well. Um, so we're at part two of application deployment. Hopefully you've had a good day so far. And hopefully you guys didn't forget everything that I taught you about application deployment um, three and a half or four hours ago, whenever it was. So, so we're going to jump into part two. So all we've done so far is we did the basic stuff. We created a very simple application, no modifications to it at all, and we deployed that application, saw the success and everything with it. Now what we want to do is show you the more complex software distribution you can implement in Configuration, to the configuration Manager 2012 and how you can control the deployment of your applications. So the scenario I'm going to run through is the scenario I kind of talked about earlier today, that I want to make sure that when Johan gets his software, he only installs it on his computer and he doesn't install software on somebody else's computer. So I'm going to create an application with two deployment types, one MSI-based that he'll be able to install on his primary de device, and a second deployment type, which is App V version, that when he's not on his primary device, he'll run the virtual version of the application as opposed to the MSI installation. So that'll be the scenario we'll run through. So it's going to involve applications with multiple deployment types, requirement rules, and I'll show you custom requirement rules as well as part of that, and user device affinity. Once we've gone through that scenario, we'll go through the application uninstall and application superseding scenarios. So that's where we're going in the next um, hour that we have left. So the benefit of multiple deployment types, there's a bunch of stuff up there on the text, but basically what it allows you to do is have the ease of administration for you guys. Remember, think about how you do things today. You have a package with a bunch of different programs in it, and you have to determine which program to advertise to which users or which collection of systems. So you have to make that determination. And if you get it wrong, then obviously the application is going to install wrong or it's not going to be available or whatever the case is. With the application model with multiple deployment types, you don't have to think about that at all. You create the app, you create the deployment types, you put in the appropriate requirement rules, and you say deploy the application. And the client figures out which one of the deployment types is appropriate to run locally MSI, AppV, Windows Mobile, um, script-based, um, Nokia, whatever it is, appropriate based on your requirement rules. And so that's really what the power and the benefit of the multiple deployment types is. So let's just jump right into a demo. Oops, not the client. It always pops up first, and I want the server. There we go. Okay, so what I did during, during their sessions earlier is I created a new application for the Microsoft um, application virtualization desktop client. That's the AppV client. And the reason I created this application is because it's going to be a dependency for me for my AppV deployment type. So I had to have the application there because remember, dependent applications are real applications. So I created that during the lunchtime so we didn't have to watch me create it. And I'll show you what that has momentarily. But I'm going to go ahead and create a new application. And uh, we can do Windows installer to start with. And we'll go to our site server, lab files, rich copy. And you can see it has two different types of the application. There's a physical version of the application, which is MSI-based. And there's an AppV version, a sequenced application. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the physical application. So I'll go to physical app, and I'll browse to the MSI. And I'm just saying I couldn't find the signature for the file. And I'll just say this is a rich copy. It's Microsoft. Oops. Microsoft. It's version 4.0. And you see the default is, again, to install in system context if I'm targeting computers. Otherwise, install in the user context if I'm targeting users, which is what I'm going to be doing in this demonstration. So I'll go ahead and let it create that one application with the one deployment type. Now I want to go ahead and add a second deployment type to it. So here you can see my application, see my deployment types, and click deployment types, and there you can see the technology is MSI. I'm going to create a second deployment type. There's a couple different ways I can do so, but I'll just go here and I'll go to application and create deployment type. I'll launch the wizard off from here. This time my application is going to be not MSI, not script. It's going to be an app V. 
So it's an app V deployment type. So I need my MSI, oops, MSI files I want. Or excuse me, not my MSI files, I want my app V. So my virtualized or sequenced application. So this requires that you've sequenced your application with the Microsoft application sequencer. So it's part of MDOP, the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack. It doesn't come with Configuration Manager. So this has been sequenced with the appropriate um, utility. So we'll go ahead and import that. And you can see in the import, it, it found some information from the manifest file, which is the XML file that it creates or from the sequencer. And you can see it's got requirement rules in here for some older operating systems that we'll go ahead and modify. OK, I'll just call this virtual rich copy so it's easy to identify. I'm going to say that I want to, on a fast network, I want to stream the content. And if I'm on a slow network, I want to download to the cache and then install the application. Now it's got my requirement rules in here that are built in, which in this case has some old operating systems. So I'll go ahead and modify this to put in my correct operating systems. I don't have Windows XP with me. I don't have any Windows Vista here. I do have a Windows 7 box. It's a 64-bit Windows 7 box. I don't have any Windows Server 2003. I do have a Windows Server 2008, which is my site server, which is Server 2008 R2 64-bit. And that's the only requirement rule I'm going to put on this um, deployment type. Um, now, this deployment type does have a dependent application. So it does have a dependency, and that is on the app v client. So I'll go ahead and click Add for dependencies. I can name it whatever I want. So I'll say app v client. And then I click Add, and this will let me pick the application I want to make as a dependent application of this deployment type. And it shows me my applications I have. So I'll take the Microsoft App V client. And you can see here it has two different deployment types. So I created the application initially with the 64-bit deployment type. Then I created another deployment type, both MSI-based, as you can see, for the 32-bit App V client. I then put appropriate requirement rules on each deployment type. The 64-bit app v client for the 64-bit OS. And the requirement rule for the 32-bit is a 32-bit OS. So it's got requirement rules so it will only install on the appropriate operating system. Now I want to go ahead and say that I can use either of these as my dependent application. So it could either be 64-bit client or 32, depending upon the operating system. So I take both deployment types. Click OK, and now it shows me that it is going to automatically install the deployment type or the dependent application if it's not already present. So it'll go through the detection method for this application. Is the app v client already installed? If not, the checkbox says to automatically install it. If I remove the checkbox for automatically install, then that deployment type would come back with a requirements not met. The requirement for this application deployment type is the app v client. It's not there, so I don't meet the requirements to run this deployment type. Now, somebody asked a question earlier about which one gets run. Um, so the priority. So here you can see I have priority, priority one and priority two. The priority is the order in which we evaluate the deployment types. So when I deploy the app v um, deployment type, when I try and run it, I'm going to analyze is the requirement there based on first deployment type for the dependent application, so 64-bit. And it's going to check to see, is the 64-bit deployment type appropriate for my client? If so, it'll check its dependencies and everything else. If that one's not appropriate, then it just falls down to the next one on the list, which is priority two. And it will check that one to see if one's available. And if I go through all the list of all deployment types and none of them match, then obviously I get requirements not met for the application. If both of these two happen to have the exact same requirement rules, so they could evaluate equally on any client. The first one's going to get evaluated because it's priority one. It'll get selected, and we'll use that one and never get to priority number two. So you'd want to have unique dependence or uh, unique requirement rules so I can identify when I should run deployment type one versus deployment type two. Make sense? Okay, and if I want to, I can change the order here. You can see I can decrease priority, or if I select the second one, I can increase priority to move them around in case I created them in the wrong order. Click OK. It shows me my one dependent application, which I could add multiple dependent applications. I just have this one. I'll click Next. Here's my summary for what it's going to do for this deployment type. 
And now it's created this application. And now you can see this application has two different deployment types. One app V and one MSI. And again, you can see the order of them is priority one and priority two. So every client, when it gets to targeted with this application for rich copy, it's always going to check the MSI based deployment type first. Is this deployment type valid for this application on my computer? If not, then it will fall down to priority two deployment type, which is the app V version. Okay, so that's all I wanted to do right there is create that application with the two deployment types. One more thing I'll do before we go back to our slides, however, is we're going to publish this, or we're going to make this application available to users in the application catalog. So what I want to do is I want to go and specify some, um, on my rich copy program application, this is on the deployment type, I want to go to the application properties. I want to go to the application catalog tab so I can specify that end user metadata that will appear in the catalog. So you can see the default language is the language I'm running on, which is English, United States. But we have oops, quite a variety of languages that we can display the application in, in application or the application catalog. Um, so we're only down in the K's. Got a long ways to go yet before we get down into Swedish. It's there. Now, I'm not going to select it because I wouldn't understand what it shows. But it would be easier for you guys. Uh, localized application name, that's just what appears in the catalog. User categories, that allows me to put in filtering categories. There aren't any by default, so I might put in tools. Tools, if I spell it correctly. And I can create as many categories as I want to. Then in the, ca in the catalog, I can click on the tools category to find all tools. I could click on line of business applications to find all the applications or utilities or custom applications, whatever categories I want to create. And I'll just create this one. The next is user doc documentation. This is a website that the user could go to to find out more information about this application. It could be an intranet site if you've got your own documentation for your applications, or it could be a public website, such as http slash www.microsoft.com. And if you want, you can browse to the URL. I'm not in the internet, so I couldn't, but you could browse it, find the URL, and paste it in here. You have link text. That's what you would appear to the user to say, click here to find more info. So click here for more information on this application. Localized description is just additional text to su supply that would appear in the catalog. This tool is a graphical file copy utility. I probably misspelled that, but that's all right. Keywords are searching. So allow me to search in the catalog when you got a lot of applications available. So I might type in file copy as my search words. And then icon, you can see the standard icon that would display. You can put a custom icon if you want to. Here's our default library of icons that are available. You can also browse to an icon if you have one specific for your application. And I'll go to Rich Copy, the virtual version, and take its app application icon. And we'll use that in the catalog. So those are the, the things I can configure for the metadata that appears in the catalog, which we'll see in a few minutes. OK, so I've created an application, two deployment types. I've configured my um, application catalog metadata. So that's all I'm going to do for right now. We'll go back to our slides, and then we'll come back and do some more properties there. So now that I've got this application, I want to deploy it to users, and I want to make sure that it only installs the MSI when the user's on their primary computer. So I have to configure that relationship. And that's called the user device affinity relationship, tying the user to the computer. And that's the key to the user-centric software delivery, is being able to get the applications to the users where they need them in the proper format or presentation of that application. So we support a single user to a single computer device, which is what most people are going to have. They have a single box that they work with all the time. You guys as admins, you can have multiple computers in your environment. And you want to tie yourself to all of those so that you can install the application and all your computers in your office. So one user to multiple devices. Or you could have a shared desktop scenario where you have three different shifts in your company where three different sets of users share that same computer, not at the same time, but in their appropriate shifts. And they all want to be able to install their own application. So you have multiple users to a single computer. 
So we support all those different scenarios. You can define the relationship as the admin, which I'm going to show you how to do. You can also allow end users to define their own relationship. They can go to the application catalog, which I'll show you later on. They can click a checkbox that says, this is the computer I normally work at, if you allow that. By default, that's turned off. So we don't trust end users to do that, although you can enable that. The benefits of UDA, again, are allowing you to tie the user to the computer so that you can do installs where appropriate and then run other types or versions of that application where appropriate. So install MSI when I'm on my computer, use App V when I'm on somebody else's computer, or remote desktop version or Citrix or the Windows Mobile Cab, whatever the appropriate type is. So it allows you to tie users to computers so that you can do the appropriate locations for installations. It also allows pre-deployment of software. What that means is I'm targeting software to the user. I can have Config Man install that software prior to the user even requesting it, and so that when the user logs on, the software will already be there. They'll have the icons on the desktop. They can just go start using the application without having to go ahead and install it. So there's eight different ways you can configure user device affinity relationships. Um, the very top one in your list says based on usage threshold. That usage threshold actually is the bottom two bullets on the slide. So in client settings, you can go in there and configure what you want the usage threshold to be. How long of a period of time does the user need to be using the box before we assume it's their computer? You can configure those thresholds in client settings, and then we'll start tracking the usage on each computer. And when you meet that threshold, we can automatically set up a user device affinity relationship for you. If you don't want to do that, then the second bullet says there's an import file. You can create a CSV file that has users and computers in two different columns, import that file, and get all those relationships established through one import process. As part of operating system deployment, so when these guys are talking about OSD, one of the things you can do is you can have, when I deploy an operating system to a new computer, I can state this computer is going to belong to Michael. So make sure you do the association with that computer and Michael as the user so it's got that UDA relationship set up automatically. During mobile device enrollment, so when you enroll a mobile device into our environment, you have to associate a user with the computer. So when that user enrolls that device, we take the logged on user ID and we associate it with the device that gets enrolled into our system. If you allow, like I said before, if you allow through the application catalog, the end user can say, this is my computer and allow that or manually by the administrator. So I as the admin can go ahead and set the relationship, which is what I'll demonstrate for you. Now applications, UDA, and task sequences. And these guys have been talking about OS deployments and you have the install software task sequence action that you guys uh, are used to from Config Man 2007. And that installs packages and programs. We've added now an install applications task sequence action to install applications as part of your operating system deployment process. Today, you guys create task sequences that don't have anything to do with operating system deployment. You create task sequences that install software, install software, install software. And the reason being, you want to control the order in which those applications or your software installs. We don't necessarily want you to do that anymore. What we want you to do now is use this dependency process in the application model and allow the application model process to go ahead and deploy your software, your applications in the proper order based on the dependencies. You can still use the install application task sequence action if you want to. The downside is task sequences run in system context, they're not targeted to users. So you can't use the user centric software delivery process in that. So generally you want to use your task sequence put your applications in your core image, or if you need to have customizations, you can put those install software, install application processes there, those actions. Otherwise, get your image installed and then let the normal configuration manager process allow us to identify the user and the, and the UDA relationship and then do your software delivery. The problem with this is that UDA gets set at the very end of your task sequence process for operating system deployment. So you're already at the very end of the process, so it takes a while for that to get established, and then we'll do the analysis to figure out who gets what applications. Okay, let me show you how to do this. So UDA relationships are established in the assets and compliance workspace. So I would 
one of the ways I can do this, I can go to the list, of, go to a user, select the user, and set the relationship. As you can see here, I have no users. So I can't do a UDA relationship yet. So what I have to do first is discover users. So we'll go to the administration workspace. I'll go to hierarchy configuration, discovery methods. And I want to show you a couple things on discovery. So that's why I didn't do this prior. And we'll just do a properties on user discovery. We'll enable it. I'll go to the container I want to browse to. And I'm going to go to the root of my forest. Otherwise, I go to a specific container like the user's container. Notice the default is to recursively search Active Directory child containers. So I'm at the root of the forest. It's going to search down through all the containers, find the user's container, and discover my users from that container. Notice that also in Config Man 2012, you can specify the account you want to use to do the discovery. In Config Man 2007, it's always the site server computer account, which doesn't necessarily always have rights to other forests. So now I can specify an account that has rights in a remote forest to do discovery of in all the different discovery methods. So I'll go ahead and select that. And the other thing I wanted to show you is on the polling schedule. Do you guys say schedule or schedule? Yes. Yes, OK. OK. So on the yes tab, on the polling yes tab, um, we al by default, we do discovery every seven days. So weekly discovery, the default in Configman 2007 is daily. So we're doing full discovery on a weekly basis. And then we have the delta discovery process enabled for every five minutes. So we added delta discovery to Configman 2007 R3. And it would discover new users, in this case, or systems. And same thing with group membership. Now it's changed to Configman 2012, which we can discover not only user additions to groups, but computer additions to groups, which we didn't do in 2007, as well as removals from groups during Delta discovery. So when a user or computer has been removed from a group, we detect that as part of the Delta discovery process. So again, you can cut down on that full discovery cycle, which is very expensive on the DCs and on your network and on the site server for processing DDRs. OK, so I'll go ahead and click OK. It's going to run a full discovery process as soon as possible. Yes, I wanted to do that. It'll take it a moment to go ahead and run the, full di the discovery process on users. So we'll go back to the Assets and Compliance workspace. Here are my user collections. We only ship with a total of seven collections in Configman 2012 versus the 12 or 14, whatever it is, in 2007. So we give you these three for users and user groups, and we give you these four for systems. And um, I want to go ahead to go to the root collection for users, which is all users and user groups. Notice it says there's zero members right now. I'm going to go ahead and update the collection membership. By default, our built-in collections have um, what we call incremental collection evaluation turned on. So within the next five minutes, it would go ahead and evaluate the new membership and update the collection automatically. We're just going to go ahead and force it to happen right now. Give that a moment to process. Once it processes, then it then it goes ahead and automatically updates the membership of all limited collections based on that one, so limiting collections. And that would be all users. So now I should be able to go to all users, click show members, and now I get my users appearing. So I've discovered the six users in my environment. I want to go ahead and associate user one with my Windows 7 client image that I was using before, which is called client one. So one of the ways I can do that is I can go ahead and click the user. And then I can go ahead and do a, oops, on the home tab. I can do edit primary devices. So I can go to Johan and say, this is the computer that belongs to him. So I'll go to edit primary devices for user one. You can see at the very bottom, there's no relationship set up by default. I know his computer name has something like client in it. So I can start typing the characters. And we'll filter them out for you and show you all the computers that match that criteria. In this case, it shows three computers that have client in them, or CLIE. And I know his is computer one. So I'll take client one and add it. I could go ahead and add a second one in here so I can put multiple devices for a single user. In my case, I'll just have the one. I'll click OK. So that's one way of doing the relationship. Another way is by going to the device. Here are the users that belong to this computer. So if I go to client one now, here's edit primary users. And now it shows me here's user one that I administratively defined. You can see it says user one, administrator defined. I control the installation or the association for that. And then up above it says, I've been tracking logons. And 
administrator in the domain has logged on to this computer four times, including the last time being yesterday. So I think maybe that administrator should be an administrator, or a primary user of this computer as well. And if I want to accept that, I can go ahead and select administrator and click add. I'm not going to do that because that'll blow up the demo I want to do. Um, and you'll see why in, just in, a, in a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to have user one associated with the computer client one. Other ways I could do this, you notice on the menu, I have an option here for import user device affinity. This is that CSV file I mentioned. You can go ahead and browse to a CSV file that you've created. And that CSV file, oops, it would now show me the columns I have, a column for users and a column for devices. I can go ahead and import that. It will take all of those that I put in that CSV file and do that relationship automatically all at one time. I could also, if I've turned on that um, client settings for UDA tracking, usage threshold stuff, I could go ahead and go to device collections and then I have the option of managing affinity requests. And then it would show me in here any requests that we had developed internally based on usage of computers. And they would appear here. I could individually select them or select them all and approve them or deny them. And then again, part of OSD, part of um, mobile device enrollment. And then when I get to the application catalog loaded a little bit later on, I'll show you how you can do so there. So I've set up the UDA relationship. Now that relationship gets informed to the client computer through policy. So I'm going to go to the client computer and I'm going to go ahead and have it retrieve policies. This again would happen automatically within the next hour sometime. I'm just going to go ahead and force it now so that when we do the application catalog demo shortly, it'll already have the UDA relationship established. So that's going to go ahead and retrieve the policy that says user one belongs to this computer client one. Okay. Now that I've got that relationship set up, now I want to tell that deployment type, the Windows installer based deployment type, to only install on the computer when the user's logged on to that same computer. So only do that installation if you're on your primary box. And that's done through a requirement rule. So we want to talk about global conditions, global expressions, which really are requirement rules. So global conditions are the requirement rules that you add to your deployment types to dictate when the deployment type is applicable. Very much like the queries you're putting on your collections today, memory, disk space, processors, um, application not installed, all those type of things you're doing today, you now make them requirement rules on your applications to make your collection processing a lot easier. We have a series of global conditions built into the product and then you can go create whatever global conditions you want to as part of your requirement rules. WMI, um, Active Directory, SQL Server based, IIS, file system, registry, and so on. And I'll show you some of those coming up momentarily. And those are how you do the requirement rules. And here we show you a default one, which is memory, a device physical memory. And in this case, they're saying memory is greater than 512 megabytes. Then you can also create custom ones. In this case, the custom example is system as a corporate device. And corporate device points to a specific registry key. So you guys create custom registry keys that you stamp your corporate systems with. And if you see that corporate registry key set, then you know it's a corporate device. So you can browse to registry and find that. So conditions are individual um, attributes that you want to search for. You can also create expressions which is a single entry that has multiple different conditions in it. Here's an example, memories of a megabyte, free disk space, 500 megabytes, operating system is Windows 7, primary device equals true, and that corporate desktop, which looked, or corporate device that looked at that registry key is also true. So you can take these five conditions, add them as one expression, and then state that this corporate primary device equals true. And it has to evaluate that all five of those is true. If any one of those five equates to false, then the entire expression is false and the deployment type is not valid for this computer. So this allows you to create templates of specific type of devices or conditions you want, reuse those for any deployment types and applications that you want. So anything you create as a custom condition or custom expression gets saved 
so that you can reuse those later on in other application deployment types. So let's go ahead and see how to do that. So we'll add requirement rules to the MSI-based deployment type. We'll then go ahead and deploy the application and see it in the application catalog. So we'll go back to our site server. We'll go back to the software library. And here's our application, which is rich copy. If I go to its properties, we already looked at the application catalog tab. Um, the deployment types tab is where we want to go next. And here you can see the two deployment types we have. Remember, we already put requirement rules on the virtual deployment type, which that requirement rule was a specific, specific operating system. That's the only requirement rule we put. You put as many as you want to on a deployment type, but that's one that was there, and we just modified it. We want to go ahead and put requirement rules on the MSI-based deployment type. So we'll go to requirements, and there aren't any by default, so we're going to go and add. And the default is device, so there's device, there's user, and there's custom. Custom, you create on your own, and I'll walk you through that. Device are those built-in ones we have, and then user is a built-in one we have, which the only option there is primary device equals true or false. So we'll take device, physical memory is greater than or equal to or less than or equal or greater than or even between, between two specific values. So you've got quite a range there. So we'll say physical memory is greater than or equal to a megabyte, I mean a gigabyte. A megabyte wouldn't be very much in today's environment. Uh, but that's, we want more than that. So we'll go ahead and take add, and we'll say free disk space on the system drive is at least a gigabyte. So now we got two. Both those have to be true before this deployment type is evaluated as true. Uh, let's go ahead and create another one. And this one will do operating system is one of, and in my case, I have my Windows 7 64-bit client, and I have the site server, which is Server 2008 R2, 64-bit. And we only want the MSI to install if the primary device is true. So we'll go ahead and click Add. And now we'll go from device to user. And there's only one condition for user, and that's primary device. And we'll set it to true. Now, I could have added primary device equals false if I only ever wanted to run the app v deployment type if I'm not logged on to my primary computer. I didn't add it that way if this, for whatever reason, my computer didn't have enough memory, didn't have this space, or whatever, I could still run the app v version of the application. But I could put that there if I wanted to. So those are my requirements. So if I wanted to, I could add these same four requirements to every single application deployment type I want. Or I could go ahead and create custom. So let me go ahead and show you custom real quick. So I'll do a custom. And then when it wakes up, there we go. There aren't any custom ones built in. You have to create them. So I'll do a create. And first one I'll do is a um, system manufacturer. And this will be Windows as opposed to Windows Mobile or Nokia. It's going to be a setting as opposed to expression. I'll show an expression in a minute. And here's all the things I can query for as far as the class or settings type. So Active Directory, Assembly Cache, File System, IS, Registry Key, Registry Value, Script, which you're wide open with scripts, um, SQL Queries, WQL, which is our query language that we have, um, and XML information. So that obviously gives you a wide range of things that you can go ahead and query for. In this example, I'll go ahead and take um, WQL, and I want to go to the root simv2 namespace, and the class I want is win32 win underscore BIOS, and the value I'm looking for is manufacturer. I only want to install this application if my win32 BIOS from root simv2 is set to a specific value. And that's going to go ahead and be a string. So I'll click OK. So that now goes ahead and creates that custom condition. And now you'll see it here in the list. I can go ahead and take this, and I can say the system manufacturer equals, and in my case, it's American Mega Trends Inc. period. So that adds another expression. So I can query for whatever I want to outside those built-in things. 
Now, what I just created now, System Manufacturer, is a saved global condition that I can use for other deployment types. OK, so now let me go ahead and show you the expression thing real quick. I'll do a custom, create, and this time I'll do a, an expression. And now I just go in there and add in the clauses I want. So that now I can go back there and say this system manufacturer equals American Mega Trends Inc. period. And now I can go ahead and add in device, physical memory greater than or equal to a gigabyte. And just add in whatever my appropriate conditions are that I want. So I can go and add all those in. I can then save this as an expression. And I'll say a standard, standard corporate device. And now what I do is I say the condition is standard corporate device equals true. Because I have that, now I can get rid of the physical memory because I got it in my, in my expression. I get rid of the free disk space and what I put in system manufacturing there, I believe, as well. So now that still has those same five conditions. Um, operating system has to be one of those two. Primary device has to be true. And standard corporate desktop has to be true, which means the memory and the disk space and the system manufacturer BIOS. So it's going to check those five things for me when I run this deployment type. So go ahead and click OK. Oh, um, so to tell whether it's an expression or uh, a, a, um, just a condition, um, let me, yeah, no, there's not a column there to tell you that. You'd have to look at that, yes. But what you can do, um, I'm done with that. That's all I wanted to do here. Um, so I will go ahead and now show you that here are the built-in ones we have. So we have the built-in ones here, and we'll see down here. Here's my system manufacturer. It tells you it's a string. Here's my corporate standard device. It tells you it's a, a Boolean, um, true or false. But it, yeah, it'd be nice if we told you that it was a expression versus a single condition. And I don't think, um, yeah, we don't have a column there for that that you can add in. But now I can go ahead and reuse this anytime I want to for any other deployment types. And I don't have to retype in those same three or five or whatever number you have for your different applications. OK, so I created, I got my, um, got my um, expressions the way I want them. Now what I want to do is take my application and deploy it. So I take this application. Um, notice I got the two deployment types. It's not been deployed anywhere. So I'm going to go to deployment and do a deploy. I'm going to go ahead and deploy to the all users collection. And notice it says six members. It's going to distribute any dependent content automatically. I have to put it on my distribution point. Deployment settings install and available. So install versus uninstall, available versus required. I'm going to do available, and I'm also going to select the checkbox here that says require administrator approval if users request this application. So before Johan can install the application, he has to get my approval or some application administrator who can go ahead and approve that application request. So I'm going to go, I'll show you that. Scheduling, because it's available, there's no deadline for it, because available means it's optional. You don't ever have to install it. So just when the application's available, it's available by default right now. We want to display in the appropriate UI. And because it's available, there's no requirement for it to be installed. You don't get the ability of creating alerts for um, compliance percent, because nobody has to have it. But you do get to create an alert for failure percentages, if you want. I'm not going to worry about that. And then summary. And then we've got our application created. So now I've created the application, two deployment types, appropriate requirement rules, dependency on the one that needs it. I've deployed it to my environment. Now before I try and run it on a client, let's go to monitoring and make sure our content's available. So now you can see the Microsoft App B desktop client is in the process of being distributed. That was a dependent app for the App B deployment type. So it has to be put on DPs as well. So it did that automatically with that one checkbox. And my actual application, let me scroll down a little bit, application's right here. 
and it's in progress. If I refresh, they're probably both done by now. There you see rich copies done, and the app v client is done. So all my content now is on my distribution point. So now I'm ready to go ahead and try and install this application, or run it anyway. So we'll go to our client computer, client one. One thing you can do is from the software center, software center is for system targeted software. This is not a system targeted software, this is user targeted. So I don't find rich copy here in the list of software. But I can, there's a link here, it says find additional applications from the application catalog. So I can go ahead and click that link. Oops, no disk in the drive, that's interesting. I don't know why that's there. Oh, I bet that's, that's from, um, that's from Zoomit. I'd loaded Zoomit before off drive D. Okay, that's, don't know why it's popping up now, but anyway. Here's the application catalog. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, it shows me who I'm logged on as. So I'm logged on as administrator. Remember, administrator is not associated with this computer. So it's not the primary user. So that'll be important here in a moment. In the lower left-hand corner, is my customization I put in there, Stockholm Deployment Event. So that would be your company branding information normally. Off the right-hand side, here's the basic information about the application that's highlighted in the um, catalog. On the far left-hand side is my browsing. As right now, it's browsing by category. You see the category of tools there. If I had um, line of business apps and utilities and custom apps, I would have all those listed here. I could also browse by publisher. So if I click on publisher, it'll only show Microsoft because that's all I have now, but you could have Adobe, you could have Citrix, you could have ABC Manufacturer, all your different publishers you have. Um, I have searching capabilities. So I want to find Adobe, so I know it's PDF, so I type in PDF and click search. And in my case, I don't have an application that has a keyword of PDF on it. So it comes back with nothing. If I go here and I type in file or copy, then it will come back and it'll search and find my application for me. I select my application. Notice here it says requires approval, yes. So it's not an application that even though it appears in my catalog, I can't directly just install it. I have to get approval from the administrator. And I'll do that in just a second. Now I can go down to the metadata down below. I can click its link and get more information. And notice this magenta color, the default is that lighter blue color. So I'll say more information. Here's that metadata that I'd supplied in the application catalog tab of the application. Keywords and so on. And here's the click here for more information on this application. And that would launch off that URL that I punched in, which is case Microsoft.com, which I'm not on the internet, so it's going to fail if I try that. Um, on the request tab, so the request button. So normally this would say install, but I've specified that option to require permission from the administrator. So I'll click request. It generates a form for me. I have to fill out a reason why I want this application. I need this application so that this demo doesn't break. Um, and then I go ahead and click Submit. It's been submitted. Now if I go click on My Application Request, it shows me that my application has been requested and the date and time. We have a very simple workflow for application approvals. So the end user requests it. The administrator sees it in the Configuration Manager console. I go to Software Library. I go to Approval Requests. And bingo, there it is. It tells me it came from Configuration Manager DOM Administrator. And its status right now is requested. I can go view the properties to see what the request was. And then I can go ahead and choose to approve or deny that request. And for my demo, I'll go ahead and say prove. Okie dokie. That's more English. You, Wally English. And now I go back to the application catalog in the client computer. And now I do a refresh. And right now, notice it says requested. When I do a refresh, it now says approved because I happen to approve it. If I want to see what the status was, the history, I can go view history, and it shows me that here's the date I requested it, what I stated in my request, and here's the response back from the admin. Let's say I, de I denied it for Johan. Well, he could come back and say, well, I really do need this, and maybe my excuse wasn't good enough before. Here's why I really need it, and he can request it again. 
and we can track that flow. There is no preventing him from reapplying for that or re-requesting that application. So even though I've denied it once. Okay, so now I go back to the application catalog and notice now the request button has changed to an install button. So now I can on demand attempt to install that application. We don't know if the install is gonna work at all or not. All I know is that this is an application that's available to me, the logged on user, or a user group I'm a member of, in this case, all users. Um, and I didn't even know if I'm gonna pass the detection methods, requirement rules, or anything. So all I know is the application's available to me. So now I click install, and it says, are you sure you wanna install this application? I say yes. And now it says retrieving computer information, connecting to server. It's building that policy and sending it down to the client. And now you see it says, evaluating requirements, going through the detection method, requirement rules, and dependencies to figure out which deployment type it needs to run, if any of them, on this client. And in a second now, it should say status complete, and it should say application installation has started. So now down in the system tray, it's downloading and installing the software. I'll let it do that for a moment. While we're waiting, let me go to my devices and if I had enabled this, which is not enabled by default, but here's that checkbox that I was talking about, I regularly use this computer to do my work. So if you enable it, users could go ahead and select that checkbox and saying, this is one of my computers. Now, you may not trust everybody to do this. Like, I may not trust Michael to do this, but I do trust Johan. So I could create a custom setting and assign that custom setting to Johan so that it's enabled for him, but it's not enabled for Michael. Yes. Um, what you see is what you get. So that is our workflow. Um, so that's our workflow. If you want anything more complicated, you use this software development kit and you can integrate with service manager or orchestrator or any other process that would give you a much more complicated workflow. But this is all we've provided in version one of the application. Yes. What you saw is what you get. So is it possible? Yes. You have to code that with the SDK. So you guys saw as complicated as our workflow is. So um, there's nothing more there. So anybody else want to ask me if they can do something else with the workflow? The answer is no. You can't without custom customizing. So that, that's really all we've done in, in the first release is what you see in the console. That's it. It goes from the portal here to the, our console an administrator with application administrator rights. So not everybody, but somebody with application administrator rights can do the approval or deny. It, would, it should also tie into the security system. So if Johan's just doing servers and this is an application for a desktop approval request, Johan wouldn't see it because he doesn't, he's not in the desktop security scope. He's in the server security scope. So Michael, who has the desktops, would see that. So there's that little bit of integration, but other than that, it's, it's a very, very simple workflow. And from there, again, you have to customize. Now, our application should well be installed by now. Um, there's our dialog that says, hey, your application was installed and can now be started. So we go ahead and click OK. Now, if I did this correctly, if I set up all my requirement rules and everything correctly, what should happen when I launch the application is down here above the system tray, you should see the app v client start and the streaming of the application because I'm not logged on as the primary user of this device. So I'll go ahead and start the application and hopefully, there we go, there's the app v client and there's the streaming process. Forget the, uh, no audio, that's just where my mouse was when I hit that. So it launched the application as a virtual application. So it's launching off the virtual version of Rich Copy, which is what we expected because the administrator is not the primary user of this device. Now I'm shutting it down, so the app v client is going to shut down. Now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and log off as administrator. I'll log on as client or user one, who is the primary user of this computer. And then what that should do for us is do the MSI-based install. So log off, and we'll switch user. We'll go to user one my super secret password. And hopefully I typed my super, super, super secret password correctly, which I did. 
Now I'll go ahead and start the application catalog. I'm not going to launch it through the um, software center. I'll just type it in manually. It's primary one CM application catalog. Application catalog. And if you don't think your users could type that successfully, you can change the name of the URL. That just happens to be what the default is. Pardon? Oh, did I, I just type primary one? Yes, primary. Oh, just primary, okay. Um, yes, that will be better if I type in the name correctly. Thank you. You guys are good. I would have been sitting here troubleshooting this for half an hour. No, maybe not quite that long. So now you can see that I'm logged on as, oh, that's right. I need to, um, I lost Zoom it. Okay, you can't see. But it does say up here in the corner, user one. Um, is the logged on user as opposed to administrator. And notice that it's got a request button again. But I already requested the application and I got approved. That was for administrator. Every single user, because it's targeted to all users, has to do the request. And just because we're short on time, I'm going to say please. I'll click submit. I'll go back over to my console and I'll do a very quick um, application request and refresh. And refresh. And there it is. We're just going to go ahead and approve it. Not put anything in. And I will go back over to the catalog. And we'll click refresh. And come on. What are we doing that for? Uh, back, to, oh, app, back to application catalog. I was in the wrong spot. Requires approval, no. Now we click install. And yes, I'm sure I want to do that. We'll let this guy go ahead and do its um, evaluation. It'll go ahead and kick off the installation. And while it is doing its um, evaluation, it started the install. So now we'll go ahead and see the balloon saying, I'm downloading and installing software. And then it will be done installing. And then we go ahead and launch off the application. And this time, the application should not be the virtual version. It should launch off an MSI installer, because I pointed to rich copy setup MSI. So it didn't really install the application. I just pointed to the MSI to do the installation. And then that gives you the scenario of the logged on user not applicable. So app B, logged on user is primary user. Then we get the um, MSI based install. So the application is always there. So now we go to our program group. And now it should pop up with the UI for the MSI installer. So now it is doing the physical install. So the application is always going to be there because it matched the other requirement rules. If the other requirement rules for memory, disk space, operating system, and remember system manufacturer, it looked at that Win32 BIOS and WMI, looked at that value. If I'd mistyped any of that, the MSI deployment type wouldn't have been valid, and it would have done the AppV deployment type again. So he's all done, did his work. So that will go back now into the console in our monitoring system. So we go back to deployment status. And here we have rich copy. We'll do a summarization. And we'll set that set for a second and see if we got, we should have the app V version back already, probably not the um, MSI base. Oops, we got MSI base back already as well. Again, it's 15 minutes by default, and I changed mine to two minutes. So let's look at the status. And the status tells us we're success for the Microsoft Windows installer version, one asset, which is client one by this user, user one. And for the virtual version, one asset, client one, administrator. So it shows me each deployment type that's run and by who. Now, what I might also want to do is I wa might want to track to see what's the most predominantly used deployment type for my application in my environment. And instead of looking at that status, I can go down to the deployment types tab. And here it shows me my deployment types and the status of them. In this case, they're both ones because I ran it on each client once or each user. And the yellowish, goldish is virtual version, and the purple is the MSI based. But this would give me all my status from all my attempted run-ins from all my users, and now I could look to see which is used more frequently. And I would expect MSI to be used more frequently. So if I see the app V being a lot more frequent, then either I got everybody's using different other people's computers, or I goofed up my requirement rules. And my requirement rules are not evaluating the MSI one properly, so it's having to fall back to the to the app v1, and I go check my requirement rules, and maybe I have to check, ch change things. So that's um, a little more status you can get from that. Okay, so I've got a 
five minutes left to go ahead and talk about the application life, life cycle. So not only can we deploy applications, but you also want to be able to upgrade your applications, remove applications, and retire applications. So we have those all covered for you in Configuration Manager 2012. So we have the new application stuff that's been there since beta 1. And it's what we're seeing here. And we have the retire application that's been there since beta 1. Retiring means the application can't have any new deployments created for it. But any existing deployments can continue to be run. So anybody that's already targeted with the application can install it, but I can't create any new deployments to any new users and new systems. That's because I'm probably getting rid of the application, so I don't want it installed anymore, um, and I'm going to go ahead and retire it. And then we also have the upgrade, which is revision history. So what revision history means is that I've created my application, I did it on Monday, and I know it worked on Monday. Today's Thursday, all of a sudden I'm getting all these errors, alerts in my console for failures. I go back and look and see, oh, um, admin 2 went ahead and made some modifications to my application on Wednesday and worked on Monday, it fails on Thursday, so it's whatever happened on Wednesday is causing the problem. So I can see who made modifications to the application, and then I can go ahead and re restore back my version that worked uh, through the revision history. So we've had that since beta one. Now we added in beta two the replacing application, which is the supersedence scenario. I no longer wanna have this old application there, I'm gonna replace it with some new application, either a new version of the same application, the Adobe Reader scenario, or a completely different manufacturer's version of the application. So we've added that in, as a beta two, and then we had the application removal. We're not renewing the license for this application. We don't have a new one yet. We want to remove this old application, uninstall it from all my boxes. So we can cover that scenario as well. The uninstall basically is a application you've modeled, so it's in our environment, and you just deploy it as an uninstall action instead of an install action. In order to do this, we have to know how to uninstall the application. So you have to, when you model the application, give us the uninstall command line. And then the other key thing, and I'll show you that in a moment, the other key thing is that, um, the very last one, if a user or computer is targeted with both a required install and an uninstall action for the same application, the install is always going to take precedence. So we won't uninstall an application that you have a required installation for that same application to a device. So if I have the application, it was required install, now I want to get rid of it, I either have to delete the required uninstall deployment, the required install deployment, or I create a different collection, get that computer out of that targeted collection that's got the required install on it, and then target the uninstall action to them. Because if you have those two things that are com competing or opposing, the install always takes precedence over the uninstall action. Now the supersedence is the ability of upgrading or replacing an application. As part of the supersedence process, I can have it do an upgrade of the application. Let's say the Adobe Reader 9.5 can upgrade to Adobe Reader 10, so I can do an upgrade. Or if I don't, can't do an upgrade, like in the scenario I'm getting rid of manufacturer one and replacing with manufacturer two, there'd be no upgrade there. I'd want to uninstall the old version and then, re, then do an install of the new version of the application. So that's what the supersedence process gives you, both those different features. And you guys can get the slides and stuff and go through all the bullet points there. But basically it allows you to do testing of new applications, keeping the old one there. And when you're ready to cut over, I flip the switch, mark it as superseded, and then we'll start doing the deployments for you. So let me go ahead and show you those, and then that's our last slide. So, um, since I've only got a minute, but Johan made me start a minute late, so I'll go a minute over. You have a break coming up after here anyway, so. All right, so we're gonna go back to our software library, and we'll go back to our application. So my old application is DCM authoring tools. That's the one I wanna get rid of. And I'm gonna have it do an uninstall First, so to do that, I have to know how to uninstall the application. So go to the properties of the application, and you see this application only has one deployment type, it's MSI based. I go to its properties, and here's my programs. Here's my install command line, MSI exec slash I, and then here's my uninstall command line, which is the MSI exec slash X. And in this case, it uses the product code. Doesn't matter whether it's product code or whatever, we just have to know how to uninstall the application.
right there on the dependencies tab. But I'll show you another way that may be easier for you. So hang on one second. Okay, so I know how to get rid of this application. So now what I want to do is create the new application. So I'll create an application. Windows installer. It's on primary one. It's on lab files. We're going to replace the DCM authoring tools with the CCM framework tools. So I know not very exciting, but it shows you the uninstall of one application and the install of another application. Come on, I don't have time for you to wait. Thank you. And I'll just say Microsoft and version 4.0. I'm not going to do any other modifications to requirement rules or detection methods or dependencies. It already got the detection message from the MSI. So now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and set up the supersedence relationship. So remember, DCM tools right now says superseded no. We're going to go ahead and change that. So I'm going to go to the superseding application, which is CCM tools. Go to its properties. I go to the supersedence tab. Applications I'm superseding. There aren't any. I'm going to add one. And I'm going to browse to the application I want to supersede. I want to supersede the DCM authoring tools application. And now I say this deployment type from this application is going to get replaced, replaced by this deployment type for the other application, the one on top. Oops, I got to click there. And I can now specify whether or not I want to uninstall. If I don't say uninstall, it assumes you can do an upgrade. In this case, I can't do an upgrade. I have to get rid of the old application, so I want to do an uninstall. So that shows you the uninstall as well as the supersedence. So now it shows me that this application deployment type is being replaced by this application and deployment type. So I'll click that. Now back to your question as far as the, seeing the supersedence relationship. Um, now if I go and do a refresh of DCM authoring tools, I can see the supersedence relationship here. Again, I have to know to go look for that. But another thing I might want to do is that I go to my application, go to this view relationships. I can go view relationships and then dependency, which you were asking about. And this will draw for me a graphical representation of my applications, or in this case, the application, and its dependencies. So here's the CCM framework tools, and it has one deployment type, no dependencies. So not very exciting. But if we go to the rich copy one and view its dependency relationship, this one does have a dependency. Come on, thank you. Make this bigger. Now you can see this application has two deployment types. One of these deployment types has this dash blue arrow, which means depends on this deployment, or this application, which has two, these two deployment types with no dependencies. One of our TAP customers had like a seven layer dependency chain in their um, application. So it's very wide and very deep as far as the complexity. You can also view supersedence relationship. So I can go here and do supersedence. And then do the same thing. CCM framework tools, this deployment type supersedes this application and this deployment type. And the last thing I'll show you before we actually implement this is the global conditions, requirement rules. So here's my application. Oops, let me go to the one that has some requirement rules, rich copy. And we'll bring that over, make it a little bit bigger. And there we go. So this application has two deployment types. This deployment type has three conditions. One is operating system, and it shows you the operating system in the tooltip. One is primary device equals true. And one is the standard corporate desktop um, equals true. And this deployment type has one, which is operating system. It gives you the operating system versions. OK, so we saw all that. So hopefully that'll help out with what your question was. Now I just want to deploy this new application, the superseding application. Oops, I don't want to create. Duh. I've already created it. I want to deploy. See, when you run out of time, you get flustered, and you start doing things that you don't want to do. Uh, we'll go ahead and deploy to the same collection we deployed to earlier. And we'll make this a, on our one DP that we have. We'll make this, here's the install, uninstall. If I just wanted to deploy an uninstall action to this application, I just do an uninstall as opposed to an install. I'm going to do that as part of my supersedence relationship, so I'll do the install. I'll make this require so it happens immediately. And scheduling as soon as possible. I'll just leave everything else that you've already seen and heard and you have committed to memory. If not, you got a videotape of it. Okay, our content's going to go on our DP, and it's going to get there right away because it's very small content, like a megabyte. 
So it'll be there, F5, and it should be there any second now. Any second now, thank you. Now we'll go to our client. Here's our client computer. And remember, here's the three DCM authoring tools applications. Go to control panel, we'll retrieve policies. And once we retrieve policies, it retrieves the policy. Now it's gonna go ahead and kick off the um, new software changes are required, downloading and installing software, and installation complete. And most of the time you don't see that first balloon that says new software changes are required. It goes away very quickly. Um, and then momentarily we'll get the installation is complete, and then we'll see that those three DCM authoring tools are now gone and be replaced by five of the tools from the Configman 2007 toolkit. And it's no more DC, DCM authoring tools. No, so superseding won't retire the old application. Um, it'll, it'll leave it in the console, so I could go ahead and deploy it again if I wanted to, because I may have a require another application that depends on that superseded application. So that would still allow it to deploy the old application um, in certain scenarios. But what it will do for me is it will now go in there in status. Um, so if I go to my monitoring workspace and deployments, if I go to my application here, and let it do that summarization. I go to the superseded application and run summarization on it. Um, it will go there. But if I do want to, I'll get the, that process for a moment. If I do want to retire an application like the old one, I would just go here. I would go to application, and I would go ahead and do a retire. I could do a retire there, and that leaves it in the system, but doesn't allow me to deploy it anymore. So what happens is these actions now are grayed out. I can't deploy it anymore but any existing app deployments are still valid for it. So now let's go back here and on CCM Framework Tools, I've got one complete, one success, one unknown. I didn't do anything on the site server computer. And now for DCM authoring tools, I have this status, one success and one blue. The blue is the requirements not met and you can't read it because of the screen resolution here, 1024 by 768. But when you guys are on your 45 inch monitors in your office, you'll be able to see everything. Um, so if I go ahead and click view status, now I see it was successful on, it was successful on primary one because I didn't retrieve policies there. Requirements not met says that this application has been superseded. So I know that I, this application is now no longer required, the requirements not met for client one because it's been superseded and it ran through the superseding process. So it removed that. So okay, I am way over. Um, so I took an extra few minutes past the <laughs> one I was allowed. So anyway, I will stop talking other than, again, the product is in release candidate. Please go download it and play around with it. Um, give us feedback on it through the Connect site. Um, the product will be released in general availability in the first half of this coming year. Um, we're releasing all the System Center 2012 products at the same time. So we're gonna be lumped in with the rest of the System Center 2012, which is the first half of the year we're releasing all of them. Um, so we don't have a more defined timetable than that for you, uh, but it will be available. So hopefully this, these two presentations I gave you gave you a pretty good flow and idea of what you can do with ConfigMan 2012, especially in the application model. And hopefully you've seen a lot of cool things with it that will help drive you towards using the new application model, although you saw that you can still do your packages and programs the way you're used to right now in a transition phase until you start getting more familiar with it and going with the new power of all the cool things that we showed you. So with that, I'll stop talking. Uh, what time do you want to back, Johan? In 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, so at 3.20. Um, so I ran 10 minutes late, sorry about that. And I'll hang around for the rest of the day if anybody's got additional questions.